this is the third lecture uh, of the course uh, Introduction to Mathematical Finance. Uh, my name is Alexander Sokol. Uh, I work for Compatible, and today we'll be talking about risk. First of all, uh, what is risk and what is the role of risk uh, in modern finance? Traditionally, the role of risk management was only to limit the amount of uh, risk taken by the traders. Uh, and um, uh, you know, the, the drawing below uh, uh, on the slide shows uh, is actually it's a, it's a you know, copy uh, of the picture that a friend of mine had um, uh, on who worked for risk management uh, had on his uh, wall many years ago. And it shows, uh, you know, scary dog, uh, which is a trader. Uh, and the only thing that's stopping this dog from destroying everything is risk management. So this is a you know funny picture, uh, and uh, certainly the traders who visited his office uh, were very happy to see it. But uh, this view ignores the important role of risk in functioning of financial markets. Risk and return are the yin and yang uh, of modern finance. So they are seemingly opposing forces that are actually complementary, interconnected, and interdependent in the financial markets. Buying and selling risk is the fuel of modern finance. So modern financial markets created financing options for technology, you know, for humanitarian causes, uh, for individuals that are cheaper than ever before, right? So if you uh, were able to, for example, um, uh, you know, get a mortgage, uh, a loan to buy a house, uh, the reason the interest rate is, uh, well, you know, of course it's uh, higher this year than it was last year, but the reason generally these rates are what they are and not a lot higher, is because financial markets help banks buy and sell risk. And by being able to manage risk, uh, they're able to then offer lower percentage rates uh, for buying houses, for financing companies, for all kinds of other causes. And the financial markets do that uh, by enabling the transfer of risk. Right? So you can say that the absence of risk is the fuel of modern finance. And modern financial markets make it possible to buy and sell the absence of risk is any other fuel. And because the absence of risk is desirable, it has a positive price. So the risk itself has a negative price. And the name of this uh, price in financial markets is the market price of risk. In this lecture, we will learn how to measure the amount of risk, how to reduce risk, and how to take risk into account when analyzing investment manager performance. So before we can manage risk, we need to, and before we can reduce risk, we need to learn to measure risk. Because if you cannot measure something, you cannot manage it, you cannot uh, reduce it. Right? So in order to uh, measure risk, measure risk, uh, we need to understand in what, what is the yardstick by which you measure it, and how can you calculate this measurement, right? And for that, there are things uh, which are called risk measures and risk models. Consider an investment manager who manages a portfolio of financial instruments. At time T, the manager invested in multiple securities and OTC derivative contracts. To do so, the investor may have used leverage, right? The ability to borrow money from prime brokers or the bank's treasury using, uh, you know, in the first case, financial instruments as loan collateral, uh, or in the second case, uh, using your uh, limit uh, with the bank treasury. So leverage is also called borrowing on margin. And the amount of money borrowed is reflected in a special loan uh, called margin account. And any investment proceeds that, uh, you know, such as the money paid for sold securities, interest payments that you receive from securities you own, dividends, derivatives, cash flows, et cetera, are moved to a sweep account, which is invested at the short term rate of interest. So the sum of the price of financial instruments in the portfolio, positive or negative, the amounts in the margin accounts, uh, negative in case of borrowing, right? positive in case of uh, uh, lending your excess cash to back to the prime broker or the treasury, uh, in the amount in the sweep account, the total of all of that is portfolio value at time t. The risk horizon, right? so in order to measure risk, you need to determine at which horizon you measure it, right? at which, what is the period of time after which you assess how much risk or, or you know, calculate how much risk you're taking. So quantitative measures of risk at, are based you know, at time t, right? so suppose today is time t, are based on the probability distribution of portfolio loss between t and t plus a certain period of time called the risk horizon. So the loss L of t, time t, right? so it's, uh, for example, today, and the risk horizon is positive if portfolio loses money and is negative if portfolio makes money. 
right? So in other words, if portfolio is worth less than today uh, at the risk horizon, you lost money, right? So it's positive uh, loss. Uh, if it's worth more than today, then you made money, so it's a negative loss. Risk horizon depends on the type of risk. For market risk, it's one day, typically. For issue risk, it's one year. These numbers uh, are prescribed by the regulators, uh, and regulators are, you know, the the their supervisors, uh, government supervisors of banks, uh, who make sure banks uh, measure the risk and don't get bankrupt. And uh, however, uh, if you know they are not prescribed, they are prescribed by the regulators. The regulators said, well, measure market risk uh, for a certain horizon, for example, one day. Measure issue risk, and issue risk is the risk that uh, you bought a bond from someone and then they basically defaulted and um, and uh, didn't uh, you know stop paying interest and did not return the principal. So for issue risk, uh, depending on the type of risk, uh, the risk horizon can, is different because certain types of risk uh, occur on a daily scale and you can measure them. Basically, generally, the shorter, the better, because if you know your risk for one day, you also know your risk for one year by simply repeating the same calculation every day. But certain types of risk, you cannot really measure or observe for very short horizons. And these horizons, they're not exact science, right? In the sense that uh, you could also measure you know, market risk for two days or for half a day, right? You can measure issue risk for half a year, uh, you know, for two years. But these are the standard way, you know, horizons at which these types of risk are measured. And if we're talking about one day horizon, the changes in portfolio value can be modeled uh, as a single step. And for longer time horizons, um, uh, uh, multiple steps are required. Right. So uh, when you're modeling portfolio change from today to tomorrow, usually you can do it uh, just uh, by calculating the probability of uh, you know, distribution for tomorrow. If we're talking about decades, right, years or decades, and there are certain types of risk, for example, that uh, you know, the, one of the things that our company, Compatible, specializes is um, uh, credit risk and credit limits. So these calculations occur at 10, you know, 20, 30 year horizon. So bank managers today calculate risk for time horizon so long that by the time that this risk, uh, this portfolio horizon occurs, uh, all of the managers in the bank actually already retire and there will be a new generation of managers managing the bank, but bank is still uh, required to calculate risk for this long horizons because the government does not want to bank to, to uh, go bankrupt tomorrow or in a year or in 30 years. Right? So there are certain types of risk that require very long time horizons. Some of them up to the expiration of the longest derivative contract in their portfolio. And these contracts uh, can be 30 years, 45 years, some of them even longer. All right, so in order to measure risk for very long horizon, you need to take multiple steps. You cannot just go in one step all the way to 30 years. So you go, for example, at the monthly steps and you go first month, second month, and eventually you get to this very long risk horizon. But for daily, you can just take one step. All right, so now uh, the um, value at risk, right? So VAR or VAR is the market risk, um, uh, is a measure of market risk, which is the risk of a loss due to a continuous stream of market moving news, right? So that's different from things like credit risk, which is the risk of a default, which is an event that occurs rarely. So market risk is the risk due to just you know, randomly, uh, you know, stock prices go up and down, foreign exchange rates go up and down, so market risk is the risk that is related to continuous movement of market quotes. For example, stock prices, effects rates, interest rates. And it's measured typically for the daily horizon. And for the typical portfolio, the probability density uh, of market risk loss has the shape shown below, right? So this is the probability density, right? And uh, probability density, meaning the probability of uh, loss, let's say, you know, the, this uh, point on this curve that I'm showing with the mouse right now, is the probability density per, you know, let's say $1 of loss when the loss is at that level. So the probability density of loss, it has a maximum, right? Because uh, things which are, you know, a very high profit is not likely, right? And again, so loss is positive, profit is negative. So high loss is to the right, uh, high profit is to the left. Very high profit has small probability, so it's lower here. Very high loss also has hopefully small probability. In the middle, there is a maximum. Okay, we're not interested in the average loss, right? We're interested because we're talking about risk. So when we're looking at about profit, we're interested in the average profit or average loss. 
when we're talking about risk, we're interested in the worst risk, right? So the question is, you know, what's worst? So let's define a confidence level P uh, and uh, then value at risk is the such loss that the probability of greater loss is one minus P. So just as an example, uh, often the threshold is set at 95%. Sometimes it's set at 97.5% to 99, but here we're set to 95%. So value at risk is such loss that the probability of greater loss is 5%, right? So this is the value at risk. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, the probability density. And on a graph, you can uh, understand it as uh, follows. The area, the shaded area shown here of loss greater than the value at risk should represent 5% of the total area under the curve, right? So this is probability density. The area under the probability density is probability. So if we're talking about the interval here, then the total probability of loss being in this interval is the area. Uh, for example, the, the probability, total probability of loss being higher than value at risk is this area under the curve. And value at risk is set such that this shaded area is exactly 5% of the total area. So one thing that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, happens here is that um, the loss that occurs with less than 5% probability, right? So value at risk is such loss that the probability of greater loss is 5%. And one important shortcoming of VAR that we'll spend the next few slides talking about, right, is the fact that it, does, it is not sensitive to how big the loss is as long as the probability of that loss is less than 5%. Right, so that's an extremely important uh, observation, right? And um, uh, uh, this is actually one of the key shortcomings of value at risk. And we'll talk about uh, where this kind of shortcoming can bite us or the bank, right? If, uh, uh, you know, that uh, bank can essentially suffer a loss that they do not anticipate and how this historically very popular measure of value at risk can be improved and recently has been improved and replaced by another more risk sensitive measure. So let me give you an example, right? And this example will be in the form of a poll, right? So a credit default swap is a financial instrument and we'll actually talk about it on Thursday in the final lecture of the series. But uh, for the poll, all we need to know is that CDS is a, or credit default swap is a financial instrument where one party receives cash fees and the other receives a very large payment, but only in case of a default of a specific third party which is called reference name. The CDS has 96 probability of $4 million profit and 4% probability of $100 million loss. So the CDS or you know, this uh, side of CDS, because remember derivative contract is a contract between two parties, right? So in this case, uh, one party is called protection seller and the other is protection buyer. And CDS is similar to insurance. In fact, it's exactly like insurance. It's insurance you buy in the financial markets against default of a reference name, right? Against somebody defaulting. So this insurance uh, is if you're selling this insurance and the probability of default of that party reference name is 4%. You have 4% probability of a hundred million loss. If the counterparty does not default, you have 96% probability when the counterparty does not default of making a profit. And this profit is simply what you are paid for providing this insurance. Okay, now, uh, and that's a slight simplification because uh, you know, sometimes uh, the default occurs later. So, and the profit um, uh, you know, comes uh, uh, basically monthly. So there are some slight variations, but that's more or less how the instrument works. And for our purposes, that's uh, all we need to know. So the question is, what is the value at risk of the CDS at the 95% confidence level? And the choices are negative 4 million, Right, because uh, essentially, if you make four million profit, then your loss is negative four million. Right, so is the value at risk negative four million? Is it negative zero point sixteen million, which is the probability weighted average of these two? Right, so ninety six percent times four plus four percent times one hundred. Right, gives you zero point sixteen. Zero, four million. Right, is your value at risk four million, or is it a hundred million? Right, which is uh, the maximum loss. So let me launch the poll. Uh, and uh, we'll see what the um, uh, uh, you know votes are. All right. So uh, 
you should see the poll at this point. Uh, not one important thing. There are only three answers you see, but actually, uh, if you scroll, so zoom uh, at least on my device, uh, my mobile device, uh, it doesn't show the scroll bar. So there are the first three answers showing, and uh, the last two. So scroll down if you think that the last two are the right answer. All right, so I can see actually uh, today, uh, you know, the um, uh, we're able to see the uh, uh, ongoing totals. So there are two. Uh, well, actually, let's see. So that what interesting. There are four horses here, and they're almost going head to head. One of them is slightly winning, right? Uh, but uh, there are four answers that are actually competing. One of them is falling behind. Uh, but uh, still, and uh, you know, there, there are a lot of um, a lot of action here. So there's no clear winner yet. Okay. So now there are two clear winners. Um, you know, that go exactly head to head. So one of them is zero, and the other one is negative zero point sixteen million. Which is the average, right? Okay, but uh, negative four million is catching up. Uh, you know which one is correct. So that's an interesting question. And positive four million is still uh, not far behind. Uh, not a lot of people people think hundred million is a var, uh, but uh, still there are some votes for that as well. So very competitive race here. All right, so I'll just wait a couple of minutes uh, until everybody has a chance to think about it. The winner of the poll is negative zero point six six million, which is the average. The second, uh, you know, is zero. Negative four million is the third, and then the other two are actually well, you know, four million positive four million is almost there. Okay, well, all right. So, so let's analyze uh, now the yeah. So negative uh, zero point sixteen is which is the average is the winner of the poll. Okay, well, okay. So uh, let me uh, now go back to the uh, slide, right? So first of all, uh, if we um, go here, right? So Clear is not the average, right? So uh, on this slide, again, I'll go back to the slide because average turned out to be the winner. Uh, so VAR is not the average. When we're talking about average profit, right? So I expected profit, that's the average. But value at risk is not, right? So one thing value at risk is not, is it's not the average. So however, the question is like, what is it, right? Well, it turns out, that the correct answer is one, right? So negative, uh, that was our third uh, actually, uh, you know, result here. Uh, Nessie, by the way, I, I still hear the chime. Can, can Same you, for where, me, where the, well. Yeah, where's the settings uh, here for that? Uh, the settings, question is whether it's recording or not. Settings yeah, just, you know, and uh, it's called in meeting basic, but it's turned off. Yeah, I think I think it's probably like once the meeting is started, uh, it's probably already too late to do it, but I, I was able somehow to do it last time. So let me just see here from, Hmm. One second. Okay, well, all right. So, so, so I think it's not a big deal. Uh, we can just continue like that, right? Okay. So, um, uh, so, so the correct answer is one, right? So negative four million because we are more than ninety-five percent. In fact, we're ninety-six percent uh, confident uh, in four million profit, right? So, oh, sorry. Uh, do I still have the, the poll? Uh, second, oh, I see the poll results, right? So, uh, yeah. So, anybody who has poll results blocking this slide, uh, just close it uh, because um, I'm not sure if I, I don't think I'm sharing it anymore, but. Um, uh, uh, but uh, you can close the poll results uh, if uh, you still see them, right? Oh, I see. So stop sharing for a second. Uh, Nancy, you turned off? Or? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Right. All right. So now it will not block anything. So uh, back to the slides, right? So the correct answer is one, right? So negative four million because we are more than ninety-five percent confident in four million profit. Again, remember the probability of profit is ninety-six percent. The probability of loss is four percent. In value at risk does not have sensitivity to the amount of loss that occurs with less than 5% probability. What happens is that you increase the threshold, right? So VAR is a threshold. So you increase this threshold until losses that are less than the threshold are 95% prob probable, right? So if you set the loss to uh, you know, some very small amount, uh, also you know, to hugely negative amount, like a profit, uh, the probability of lower loss will be zero, right? So then you start increasing the threshold until the probability of loss lower than the threshold is 
and that's where your bar is. You never reach the remaining 5%, right? So as you, um, uh, you see my video, right? Uh, so, so as you increase the threshold, you stop when the probability of a lower loss is, is 95%. If there is a loss in this remaining 5%, you will not see it. You stop before. So the loss of 100 million, which is really scary to think about CDS, occurs with a probability of less than 5%. This is a 4%, right? So when you set the threshold at such that 95% probability, such a lower loss than the threshold has 95 probability, that threshold is still a formula in profit, right? You never reach this loss of 100 million because it has a probability of 4%, but you are blind to the last 5%. Right, so for VAR, physicists, you know, those who are physicists will recognize, right? So it's like the black hole event horizon, right? What's inside cannot be seen. When you have a black hole, there's something called event horizon, right? And uh, whatever is inside this event horizon, you don't know what's was there, right? So same thing, you don't know what's what's in the last 5%, or rather, you know, value at risk does not tell you, it does not sensitive to that. So coming back to this, uh, you know, familiar guy, uh, you know, Alexander, so, you're sorry. muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so coming back, uh, coming, uh, coming back to this uh, familiar, to the familiar, to the guy familiar from the first lecture, we're speaking up uh, nickels, five cent points uh, in front of a steam roller, right? So this guy calculated his value at risk, and as long as the probability of being run over by the steam roller is less than five percent, he will think that he's just making profit, right? He will not realize that uh, that there is a loss. So value at risk for this guy with the steamroller will show a few you know, dollars of profit and no risk. So value at risk is imperfect, it's useful. And at the time, of course, it was introduced many decades ago. It was a pioneering uh, concept of being able to measure risk quantitatively as opposed to just saying, uh, you know, a lot of risk here, right? So it was a pioneering measure of risk. However, uh, it's an outdated measure today because there are better ways and we recognize the shortcomings. Okay, so how can we improve it? Okay, so uh, let's just try to understand, first of all, what hap will happen to the long-term uh, investor in CDS or specifically CDS protection seller. So that's the party to the derivative contract, which is CDS, who sells protection, right? So someone who is essentially selling insurance against the default, the other party is buying. So what will happen in long-term to the CDS protection seller who does not take steps to reduce the risk? Okay, what will happen is that year after year, the strategy will make $4 million per year, right? So every year you sell CDS protection on some name. This name has 4% probability of default. In the first year, they don't default. You pocket the $4 million profit and you don't have to pay anything. So, you know, your bank is very happy with you. You get a bonus, right? After about 25 years on average, a hundred million loss will bankrupt the bank. Well, you know, if it's a large bank, it will not, but if it's a small bank, it will. At this point, after 25 years, right, that's more or less like if someone comes to the bank uh, after college and basically works there all their life, you know, it's pretty close to retirement. So at this point, the trader will bring a regrettable one-time error in the end of a hugely successful career of making uh, money every year. This is actually very rare in finance, right? So people who make money every year, they're extremely, extremely rare. And in a lot of cases, they're actually just lucky, right? So the trader will, bring, will blame a regrettable one-time error and retire, right? And that's a great outcome for the trader, but not for the bank. And this is why risk management and regulators now require a better risk measure called expected shortfall. And the alternative names for expected shortfall are conditional VAR or CVAR. By the way, CVAR used to be called, so credit VAR is something that's no longer in use and also abbreviated to CVAR. So when you hear CVAR today, it most likely means conditional VAR because credit VAR is not something that you calculate uh, unless, you know, you, unless you got frozen in time for 20 years, right? Or expected tail loss or ETL. And all three of them mean the same thing. So this actually, uh, again, just before we go um, into details of what expected shortfall does and why it's better than value at risk, generally, the financial markets are amazing at creating uh, and being able to tailor your probabilities as long as the average remains the same, right? What it means is that you can create a financial market strategy, a trading strategy. 
that will give you a small, a large, huge probability of a small profit and at the expense of a small probability of an enormous loss, right? So in other words, uh, the no arbitrage principle that we discussed uh, in the first and second lecture tells us that you cannot just have riskless profit. And well, hopefully, unless you're doing something really silly, you don't have a riskless loss, right? So, so there's no, you know, in financial markets, uh, if there is no risk, then there is no profit, there is no loss. However, if there is risk, what, what financial markets can do is to give you probability, a high probability of a small profit, if there is also a small probability of very high loss. Now, anybody who invested in Forex or in crypto is familiar with that. Because what happens with people who try to trade Forex, which by the way, Asana guy very highly don't recommend, right? So don't trade uh, Forex uh, as a uh, individual, uh, you know, the brokers, the brokers uh, that uh, work with retail, actually, uh, you know, they don't really um, uh, give you a good opportunity to beat the professionals. Uh, same thing with crypto, right? So you need to, you know, if you want to trade professionally, you know, you should uh, learn how to do it and uh, do it for a trading firm or a bank or, or an investment fund. But those who uh, traded Forex or traded crypto know that what happens normally is that you make a little bit of money, you're very happy, then you make some more money, you think your trading strategy works, right? And then all of a sudden you lose everything, right? And you think, oh, it just was a lapse, you know, I didn't take this into account, next time I try it, this will not happen. Actually, it will happen every time. And this lecture, this course, and generally the field of mathematical finance will help you understand why. However, I would like to emphasize, so I don't recommend anybody trading uh, personally on these retail brokers who basically will always make money and retail investors always lose just because of this whole game is set up. So if you want to learn this, I think it's helpful if you, uh, uh, you know, understand, um, uh, you know, what will happen to the retail Forex trader or retail crypto trader, uh, but what will, you know, basically what, what I'm essentially trying to drive at is that uh, when people think that they have a successful strategy uh, and it makes some money this month, next month, a few months, right? And then all of a sudden everything is lost, right? And the entire investment is gone, right? Or the large chunk of it. There's actually how it's supposed to work in the financial markets. Does the, the essentially, if you calculate using models, what your risk is, you can see exactly why it happens. It's not an accident, right? It's not, uh, you know, people think, uh, uh, you know, oh, you know, it's uh, like, it, it's like in the, basically in a casino, right? People think that they have a roulette winning strategy, right? But one does not exist. Any mathematician knows that. Financial markets are very similar, right? So you can trade huge loss with small probability for small profit with large probability, but you cannot create profit without risk, right? So there's always a risk. You can control if you know financial markets, if you know mathematical finance, you as a professional in a bank, an investment manager, or a trading firm, right? All you know, three things basically participate in financial markets trading. You will understand exactly what risk you're taking, exactly what your profit expectations are. And uh, that's what this whole field is about. And it's a very interesting field. All right. So anyway, so uh, so let's see, you know, come back now to expect a shortfall, right? So, uh, so for 95% confidence level, ES is the weighted average of the worst 5% of losses, right? So if the poll was about expected shortfall and uh, you, know, you would select the average, right? That actually, if we expect a shortfall, that would be the correct choice. So expected shortfall is the average of the worst 5% of losses, right? So VAR is a threshold. And it is not, essentially VAR stops here and it is not really sensitive to losses in this uh, you know, dashed area, but Expected shortfall is the average of losses in this dashed area. So for a typical portfolio, expected shortfall and value at risk are comparable and the expected shortfall for the same uh, probability is higher. And when expected shortfall is much worse than the value at risk, it is a warning sign that the major loss is hiding among the worst 5% of outcomes, right? So when you compute value at risk and it's a couple of million and you compute expected shortfall and it's 10 times higher or 100 times higher, that's a sign that there is an enormous loss with small probability. And that's not something that you want to do if you trade in the financial markets. Okay, so if you think of value at risk and expected shortfall as movie characters, for this CDS, right? So VAR has 
kind of a basically uh, actually <laughs> it's an error in the slide. So it has five percent field of view, right? So then not ninety ninety five percent would have been pretty good, right? So VAR actually has uh, because uh, you know what you care about is the view of the loss. So VAR has five percent field of view of the loss, right? And uh, expect a short wall can see everything, right? So uh, you know those of you who seen the Mandalorian, right? Uh, generally, Star Wars. Uh, I was always wondering how uh, these guys in these helmets actually see anything. Apparently, there is a screen inside, right? But generally, when you have a helmet, right? When you're a medieval knight, you have a helmet that has basically like a field of view like this, right? So I don't know how you can see something coming from the side. It's probably uh, you know not very safe, right? Whereas this guy, uh, you know, who is a uh, you know a robot bounty hunter, right, has cameras all around the head. So the guy on the left. Is like value at risk, right? You don't see anything outside this visor. The guy on the right is like expected shortfall, right? So you see, you know, he has cameras all around the head and he can shoot forward, back, or whatever. You can see a risk everywhere. So expected shortfall is the average of the lost 5% of loss. So the four, there's a 4% probability of $100 million loss. There is a 1% probability of a $4 million profit. Why 1%? Because it's actually 96%. But we only care about the last 5%. And of this 96%, only the last percent gets into this 5% threshold, right? So, so, so you have a total 100%. You care about the average of the last 5%. Of the last 5%, 4% is the loss, and 1% is profit, right? So 4% probability of the loss and 1% probability of the profit. So expected shortfall, if you average these two, is about $80 million. And that's more like it, right? So expected shortfall now gives you a lot more realistic view of what the loss could be, right? It's actually the maximum loss is 100. Here's um, uh, 80 million. So uh, that is a much more informative measure of the real risk you're taking as a CDS investor, CDS protection seller who does not take steps to reduce the risk. And we'll talk about how to reduce the risk a little bit later today. If there are any questions, please type them in the chat, as I already mentioned uh, previous lectures, uh, same thing. So, uh, so please type them in the chat and my colleagues uh, will alert me uh, or answer directly. All right, so, so now let's continue, right? So what are the risk model types? Probabil portfolio value uh, generally is, you know, and we need to compute portfolio value in order to, um, uh, in order to compute risk. So portfolio value is a deterministic function of what's called risk factors. And risk factors are price of securities, derivatives, commodities, foreign exchange, LIBOR rates, and other market observed values required to calculate, um, uh, you know, the, the, to price the portfolio, or calculate portfolio value. So by definition, anything that portfolio value depends on is a risk factor. Some of these factors are discrete, right? So for example, there are issue ratings, there are bankruptcy events, uh, we will not consider them in this lecture, but you also need to include them in the risk. It's just a more complex topic that uh, we cannot cover in uh, 90 minutes. So we will talk about continuously changing risk factors, things like interest rates, things like effects rates or stock prices. So to calculate risk, risk managers must first model the joint probability distribution of risk factors using risk models. And from it, calculate the probability distribution of portfolio losses. Right. So first you calculate the probability distribution of risk factors, then you price portfolio for each of these risk factors, and then calculate the probability distribution of portfolio losses. And risk models come in three categories. The first category is parametric. Uh, it's an outdated category. Nobody calculates risk this way anymore. So we'll not study it today and uh, wherever. And uh, this is something that just exists, uh, you know, as a historical uh, curiosity, right? So it, again, it was a pioneering model 30 years ago, 20 years ago, perhaps even uh, when uh, that, you know, that was one of the first way to quantitatively look at risk. But uh, today, nobody does parametric. The two ways that people use today or banks use today is historical, which is, uh, a risk model which applies historical risk factor shocks or changes to today's risk factor values. This is based on the assumption that all risk factor shocks that occurred during the selected historical period, for example, past five years or past three years, have equal probability of occurring in the future. And 
second method that's used uh, today, so there are three methods, two of them only are used to this day, right, is Monte Carlo simulation. It applies simulated risk factor shocks to today's risk factor values with the help of a random number generator. So historical, uh, the way it works is that when you, for example, use historical calculation of market risk, on top of today's, uh, so, so you generate statistical sample on top of today's values risk factors. And you do that by obtaining the statistical sample by starting from the value of risk factor today and adding the change in risk factor sometime in the past, between someday in the past and the next day. So for example, suppose that the stock price today is 100. And in the past, there was a day when the change, uh, when the stock price went up to dollars, right? So suppose that today is, is the price is 100, but one year ago was a day, there was a day when the price was 80 and the following day it became 82. What you do is that your first statistical sample is you, you take the difference between these prices in the past, the price for this historical day in the past and the price the next day after that. So $2. And you add it to today, right? So in other words, uh, historical simulation does not mean that you uh, predict that the price will be 80 or 82 tomorrow. You take the difference between the price one year ago and the price that one day, one year less than one day, right? So in other words, the, the price one year ago and the price one day after that day, one year ago. So suppose it was 80 and became 82. You take this $2 difference and you apply it on top of today's price of 100 to obtain a scenario in which the price is 102. Now, suppose that another day in the past, the price was 70 and becomes became 65. So that's a $5 loss. You take this $5 loss or in stock or reduction in stock price, it's not necessarily a loss for your portfolio, depending on what you, what you hold. Uh, and you take this uh, $5 reduction in stock price, and apply it to today's stock price of 100, so get 95. So your second scenario will have 95%. So this diagram here shows how this works, right? So you take all of these historical changes, A, B, and C, right? So there are three historical changes, A, then change A, then change B, and change C. You apply all of the changes to today's initial price. So you basically do a parallel shift. So that's how historical uh, you know, model works. And that's, you know, despite the simplicity is a very popular and actually model, you know, it's a model preferred by the regulators because the other alternative, Monte Carlo, uh, it has a lot of, uh, it does a lot of, uh, it requires a lot of work from, uh, you know, people like you who, who study mathematical finance. And every time there is something complex, regulators, uh, you know, normally, uh, uh, you know, they're concerned that uh, they're concerned that, uh, uh, you know, some error may be in the calculation. They're concerned that there may be some subjective assumptions in the calculations. So when you build a model for anything, it could be a physics or it could be a mathematical finance. There's always some subjective decision of how to do it. And it's a lot more difficult to verify. And it's a lot more difficult to ensure that all banks measure risk the same way. And to be fair to, to banks, you know, regulators want them to, be on the level playing field, right? So the, all the banks should measure risk the same way. So, so there aren't banks who measure risk better and are punished by not being allowed to trade more. So regulators prefer historical models because of the standardization, but there is only a very limited number of types of risk that you can measure using historical simulation. For example, market risk, uh, to some extent issue risk, but other types of risk like credit risk uh, limits and other types of risk, uh, you know, they cannot be measured with historical and you measure them with Monte Carlo. All right, so Monte Carlo model works in a similar way to the historical model, but instead of historical realized risk factor shocks that you take from, from past data, it generates a statistical sample based using model parameters in the random number generator. So this image below shows the histogram of the probability density of stock price changes over one day obtained from the Monte Carlo model, right? So in other words, instead of using the historical time series directly, the model uh, is what's called calibrated, right? So in other words, these parameters are estimated from market data, from option prices, uh, in case of risk from historical data. Uh, and then you use a random number generator to generate uh, what's called simulated uh, or Monte Carlo probability distribution of what 
where the stock could go, right? So, so you start from $100 today, and you generate 100 random future stock prices based on your model. And the probability that you use to generate it is determined by your model, and you estimate this model using statistics uh, from the data. All right, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, question uh, in the chat? No, so far? Is there is one in the chat, please check. Uh, okay, one second. Okay, so, um, right, okay. Uh, uh, right, so do you recommend Binance's platform for trading and making financial transactions? Well, then Anastasia already answered, uh, but generally, uh, uh, I highly recommend that you don't use uh, crypto, you don't trade crypto to make money because uh, there is always a probability of a high loss hiding among your winning trading strategy that brings you a small profit every day. So if you trade crypto to make money, you will you know, should be ready to lose most of it at some point. Uh, I will not, as nice as I said, make recommendations about uh, which crypto platform to use uh, if you just simply want to store your money in crypto rather than trade it actively, right? Uh, and that's not the question really for this course. Now, what are the what if there are no historical data for some of the factors in the portfolio? That that's actually a brilliant question, right? So because that's actually one of the things that you have to fight with. Even uh, today, this morning, um, uh, you know, I had a phone call where we were discussing exactly the type of a project uh, which uh, has to do with uh, what to do when there are no historical data for some of the some of the factors in the portfolio. When can it happen? So that's actually a question that um, is a brilliant question uh, and uh, a very important question. That's one of the things that risk managers actually work on or quants who study might finance work on. First of all, how can it happen? Well, it can happen, for example, if uh, the stock just, uh, you know, basically had a public offering, right? So started trading on the financial markets. So a company was private. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, Facebook was private, then it got listed on the stock exchange. So when a new company gets listed on the stock exchange and before only private investors own the stock, you don't have the history, right? In other situations, a corporate event, for example, a split, like uh, General Electric is a conglomerate of many companies. They split, uh, they decide to split and uh, you know have their power turbine, turbine business in one company, aircraft engines in another company, uh, you know, and uh, and um, uh, you know refrigerators in a third company. So uh, when the one company splits, you don't know, uh, you know, you don't have history for the constituent parts. So that happens all the time. There are several ways to deal with that. So one of them is proxy, where you find they use the average of similar companies, right? So for example, if there is a new, let's say, um, manufacturer of phones, of uh, smartphones, Android phones, uh, comes to the market and starts trading, you can use the average of similar companies uh, and uh, until you know the, comp the stock gets traded longer and then you have the data. So that's one of the ways to deal with it. But generally, that's one of the things that uh, you need to deal with. And uh, you know, the, when there is no history, you cannot use historical model directly, but you can estimate it using some uh, you know, proxies. Sometimes an analyst will uh, uh, manually come up with a model for risk. And eventually this problem goes away uh, because uh, as time passes, you accumulate the history. Typically in a large diversified portfolio and diversified means it has many different investments. Uh, if a few of these factors don't have the history, it will not have a huge effect on the risk of the overall portfolio. However, if you are calculating risk of this only investment, and that's something that does not have the history, then of course there is a lot better, you know, greater possibility that your model will be wrong. So that's more dangerous. So, so, but th thank you for the questions. Actually, a very good question. Any other questions before I continue? No more. Okay, good. All right. So. Uh, now, uh, one second, let's just go back to the slides. All right, so now risk management, right? So we learned how to measure risk. Now we need to learn how to manage risk. First of all, uh, you can manage the risk. Oh, managing means not necessarily reducing completely or not necessarily eliminating, right? You cannot eliminate risk. If you eliminate all risk, you also eliminate all profit. But you can partially reduce risk. You can also understand risk, right? So now we talk about risk management. So again, it's how to reduce risk. So one way to reduce risk is hedging. 
right? And hedging is a way to reduce risk, amount of the amount of risk in a static or dynamic actively managed portfolio. So hedge, uh, well, generally, uh, you know, basically hedge is like a basically word, uh, English word has many meanings. And one of them is to avoid something, right? So hedging is a way to avoid some of your risk. It's accomplished by buying or selling securities or entering into over-the-counter derivative contracts that have a loss when the original portfolio has a gain and vice versa, right? So first of all, why would you do that, right? Why would you invest in some instrument and then invest in the opposite uh, you know, instrument, right? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, well, the reason is that, uh, for example, if you're a bank and you give, uh, let's say, a loan to buy a house to someone, you took some risk. And maybe you want to keep some risk, but not all of it because it's too much, right? It's, it's too risky. You don't want to, maybe you're okay to lose 1 million, but you're not okay to lose 100 million. So sometimes uh, you unload all of the risk because your role is an intermediary. You have a client who wants to you to buy risk or take away risk from, 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 from them, right, from the client. So you enter into a financial instrument that transfers the risk from the client to you. But if you're a small bank, you're an intermediary. You have a relationship with the client. You know the client. You go to lunch together. You know about their business. You are the banker. But you don't want to keep all of the risk. So then you go to the dealer, a larger bank. You are a client, so this company is client of yours, but you're also client of the dealer. And you say, well, I have too much risk, risk take it away. So one reason why you want to hedge is because you're an intermediary, right? And then you make money on the margin, right? So you charge a little bit more to take the risk from the client than you pay to take the risk to the dealer to take the risk from you. And that's your profit, right? Or you want to keep some of the risk because if you keep some of the risk, you also have profit, right? So when you have risk, you have profit in the financial markets, right? So if you want more profit, you can keep some of the risk, but not all. Okay, so hedging reduces the loss when it occurs in exchange for reducing the gain when it occurs. And if hedging never reduced gains, it would violate the no arbitrage principle. So the effectiveness of hedging is measured by the reduction of risk for hedge portfolio the combination of original portfolio and the hedges compared to the original and hedge portfolio. Now, again, so you reduce the risk, right? So, but not across the board, or rather uh, when you reduce the risk, you reduce your loss, but you do it at the expense of reduced profit. And one of the ways that you reduce profit, if you pay someone to take the greatest loss from you, the amount you pay is the reduction of your profit. If risk management or hedging never reduce gains, it would violate the no arbitrage principle. And remember, these guys in front of the steam roller are, very, are working very high to assure that there is no, there is no uh, you know, arbitrage, right? So somebody, every time there is arbitrage, it's like a pile of money in front of a steam roller. And if the pile is big enough, somebody will run and uh, pick it up, you know, trying not to get hit by the steam roller. And their work ensures that there are no piles of money on the ground, right? So in financial markets, profit without risk is a pile of money on the ground. Maybe the steam roller is somewhere nearby, right? But if the pile is big enough, somebody will go and pick it up, right? And these brave people who do that, all the arbitrageurs, right? They ensure that you can say, okay, you know what? There is no, um, uh, you know, efficient market. Uh, markets are efficient and there is no riskless profit in the financial markets. All right, so. Uh, Paul, uh, what is the change of portfolio value when entering into an OTC derivative contract to reduce or hedge the market risk, right? So in other words, you had your investment and you would like to reduce all either completely eliminated risk or reduce some of the risk. If you do that by entering into a derivative contract, what is the change in portfolio value that occurs immediately after you enter it into a derivative contract? Does it increase? Does it remain the same? Or does it decrease? And this is actually a trick question. The answer is not obvious. So let's launch the poll. All right, you should see the poll now. Okay, so there are three answers. Uh, even if you don't have the scroll bar, they all should be on the screen. All right, so. All three uh, in the running increases and remains the same uh, ahead, decreases, uh, you know, slightly behind.
now decreases uh, went ahead we, we actually uh, i'm not saying that's the right answer but like you know like uh, you are basically paying someone right to reduce your risk right so uh, i'm kind of surprised that it increases uh, such a high, high uh, probability right but i just say it's a trick question so i don't know All right, a couple more minutes and uh, we'll see the results. Wow, so close, so close. <laughs> That's right. Well, one of the answers uh, <laughs> really fallen behind and the other one I go head to head, but which ones are, which ones are these? We'll find out pretty soon. Okay, so well, more than 50% yeah, of people participated, yeah. Each answer has 11 answers. Well, so they're the same, increases and decreases. Yeah. It's interesting, exactly. It decreases and increases has 11 answer each. That's amazing, right? It means the same uh, has less, right? So what is the correct answer? All right, so, well, maybe it's time to end the poll. Uh, you know, so far uh, over 60% uh, participated, so two thirds approximately. Let's send the poll and share the results. Okay, so increases, 12 answers. Decreases also 12 answers, remains the same, four answers. What is the correct answer? Okay, well, uh, it turns out that the four people who bravely thought it remains the same were absolutely right. Because what happens is that, uh, remember the OTC contract, right? So that's from the previous lecture. When uh, a hedging instrument is bought or sold, OTC contract is executed. Its value in the portfolio is equal to the outflow of money that we used to pay for it. So it does not change the total, right? So uh, remember portfolio value, is the sum of your investment of the money you borrowed with a negative sign, right? Of the money that you have in the sweep account, which is what uh, you receive when uh, you receive dividends and so forth. So when you go and say, well, you know what? I'm going to reduce my risk. You could enter into what's called a bilateral derivative contract. And we studied it uh, in lecture two. And a bilateral financial contract is something that that uh, basically you just uh, undertake one obligation and take another obligation. And typically for, for many of these bilateral contracts, no money changes hands initially, right? It, it, not for all though, like for swap, for example, something called a swap, interest rate swap, uh, again, where we, which we already discussed, uh, you know, money does not change hands. Uh, if you're buying an option, it does, right? But if, you, if you're buying security or entering into a derivative contract, what happens is that if you are paying money, either you mon no money changes hands, or in the value of the instrument is zero, or you're buying it for some money and then you are receiving in exchange something that has the same value. Increase or decrease of portfolio as a result of a hedge would be riskless profit or riskless loss, right? Because essentially what happens is that you had no instrument, then all of a sudden, you had higher value of your total portfolio or lower value of the total portfolio. So the only thing that can happen to, to your portfolio is the result of your action is zero price change, right? In other words, if you buy something or you sell something, you do not change the value of your portfolio. Only market news or changes in market prices will change the value of your portfolio. That's a very important thing to, uh, to um, uh, note, right? So, so in um, uh, generally trading risk management, your action when the markets are frozen, will not change the value of the portfolio. If you buy something, you paid money and you have something that has the same value. If it had more value, it would be riskless profit. If it had less value, it would be riskless profit for the other party. And these guys in front of steamrollers are treasurers. Make sure that things like that don't happen, right? So they keep the prices in line such that everything, um, uh, you know, basically whatever you pay for has the same value. So it does not change, right? So the value of this thing is what, you know, is, is um, uh, due to what happens in the future. So when you paid for the hedge, your future changes in portfolio value will, you know, when it's a loss, right? Your loss will become smaller. Maybe it will be always be smaller. Maybe it will just reach some threshold and stop there. But the change in portfolio value that occurs it's a future change is a result of market moving. It's not an immediate change as a result of your action because immediate change is the result of your action. 
would be arbitrage and it's not possible. Okay. So when the, so the value of the hedge is in a later change in portfolio value that it does, right? As opposed to today. Now, fully hedged portfolio is a portfolio combined with hedge that eliminate all of the risk, all the potential, you know, all potential losses, right? And according to no arbitrage principle, these hedges will also eliminate all of its potential gains, right? So if there is no risk, there is no profit loss. So full hedging is useful to a dealer, we already discussed it, who wants to basically take away the risk, um, uh, you know, from or, or useful, uh, 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 well, to, to, to a bank who works with a dealer or a dealer who uh, wants to unload the, the, the risk to the broader financial markets, right? And um, uh, sometimes you hedge the entire portfolio altogether, Sometimes you hedge a single instrument, especially when it's a very complex bespoke, bespoke instrument. This is called a back-to-back -back hedge, and you can only hedge it completely with an identical instrument, uh, which is reversed, right? So in other words, you enter into a derivative with someone, and you enter into a mirror image of the derivative with someone else, except for the small, what's called a margin, right? So difference in percentage rate that you get for being the intermediary. In a partially hedged portfolio, it has an improved risk profile, which eliminates most extreme losses, is at the expense of reduced gains, right? So sometimes you simply enter into a back-to-back -back instrument. So the same thing as fully hedged portfolio, right? So you enter into back-to-back -back instrument or hedge the entire portfolio, but not completely, right? So in other words, uh, you would, to have a complete hedge, you would buy, let's say, 100 million worth of uh, options. But here, those stocks. But here, you buy only 50 million worth. So you leave the half the risk unhedged and half the risk hedged. Right, or you use derivatives specifically designed for this purpose, such as options that are tailored to do what you want. Like, for example, you want to eliminate the risk, you know, that's uh, above certain threshold. And modern financial instruments can be used to make highly targeted adjustments to the probability distribution of losses in order to achieve the desired risk profile, according to the bank's what's called risk appetite. So, risk appetite is exactly the type of a. It's actually risk appetite is actually very formal and extremely important. Um, document of the bank, which the bank provides to the government regulators, government regulators, to tell what kind of risk they're willing to take and what kind of risk they're going to unload uh, and sell uh, to the financial markets, right? And the regulators then look at this risk appetite statement. And first of all, they say, well, that's okay with them and that's not, right? And then they monitor the compliance. So they, they then, once they, they approve the risk appetite statement, then they monitor if the bank really follows the risk appetite statement. Is the bank taking any, for example, the bank may say, we're not going to take any crypto risk. So they better than not have any crypto investments or they fully hedge them. Or they will say, we will not take any, you know, our, let's say, uh, retail credit risk, meaning people who have credit cards, uh, our retail credit risk exposure will be less than a hundred million expected shortfall. They will then monitor if this is really the case, right, using the risk model. So risk appetite is your, and you know, you, as a private investor, you can also have risk appetite to say, I will put all of my money in the bank, or I will put some of it in, uh, you know, stocks, for example, right? So risk appetite is something that the bank decides about how much risk they want to take. And financial markets is where they can go and sell additional risk by buying various kinds of insurance, uh, uh, you know, specifically tailored insurance like CDS, or just financial instruments that accomplish this goal. Okay, so let's uh, use one example, right? So consider partial hedging using options, right? So American put option, uh, as you probably know, right, is uh, the right but not the obligation to sell a portfolio asset at any type up to including time T for price K, right? Which is, this, uh, so K is called option uh, strike. If the portfolio or asset loses its value and worth less than K, then the value of the combination of asset and the put option never falls below K, right? So put option is insurance against stock price falling below the strike. If you buy the stock in the put option, you bought the stock and the right to sell the stock to someone at K. So to you, you can never, the price of stock stops at K, right? Even if it's a price worth zero, somebody, is obliged to buy it from you for price K. So now consider a trader, right? Who bought the stock for 100 and believes it will be 120 in a year or in a month, but may initially be down, right? For example, 
the stock price has been falling and the trader is convinced that the fall will stop and the stock will recover. But the trader does not know if, this, if the fall will continue a little bit longer or will stop immediately. But the trader works for an asset manager, right, a firm, whose policy is to eliminate any investments that are more than 10% down from the initial value. Many investment managers or hedge funds uh, or you know, trading desks have this policy, right? So you know, if somebody lost 10% of their capital that they've been entrusted, they simply eliminate all of the position and fire the trader. So that's actually, you know, it brings a lot of discipline, right? So it's not like you say, oh, you know, like uh, my homework is late, right? So you say, well, you know, like, uh, oh, here, you know, there's a loss, but it will recover, it will get better, right? So it actually is it's very, it's very, it's very strict, right? Uh, it's very harsh, especially for people who could lose the job. But also, also it brings a lot of discipline, right? So people in financial markets, they, they know like, you know, 10% loss, that's it, they're out of the job and they lose the opportunity. Maybe it would come back, right? But you never find out, right? Because uh, basically the position is eliminated. So it brings a lot of discipline, right? So people spend a lot of time thinking about how to avoid a 10% loss. So, well, one way to avoid it is to buy an American put option. Let's suppose this option is worth $5. And if you buy American put option with strike of $95 for $5, then the trader knows for sure that this price of the option in the stock will not fall below 90. Because uh, you have the, the price of uh, the, so your stock now cannot be worth to you less than 95 because somebody who sold you the option is required to buy it from you at 95 if you want to sell. And of course, you will only ask them to do it if the price is zero or you know, 50, right? If the price is 200, of course, you will just sell it on the market for 200. So you will not necessarily exercise your right, but they are supposed to, to uh, they have an obligation to buy it from you if you want to sell. And you paid for the option $5. So by paying for the option $5, you now have a portfolio that cannot fall below 90. And you spend 100 on this portfolio. So your bank manager will never fire you because you will never reach this 10% loss, right? So it will stop at 10% loss and no good lower. But what happened is that it cost off the profit of 20 that you expected. Now you only get 15 because you spend five on the option. And if the stock goes to 120, you will not use the option, right? You will sell it for 120. So what happens is that we can see, right? So derivatives and other financial instruments helped trade some of the most extreme loss for some of the profit. And essentially what you did is that you eliminated the risk that you don't want in order to, uh, you know, by trading, uh, by giving up some of the gains that you expect. And that's what financial markets do, right? That's how they make uh, investing efficient. That's how they make investing more accessible to retail investors who don't have a lot of money to invest or they make it possible for the bank to lend you money at a lower interest rate than otherwise they would, because you can unload the risk that you don't want. The risk appetite of the trader is that the trader does not want to have more than 10% loss. More than 10% loss and the trader loses the job. So the financial instrument, which is the put option, help the trader to meet the risk appetite objective. All right, any questions on that before we continue on the last two? Not yet. Okay, great. Right. So market price of risk, right? Okay, so Paul, uh, we already talked about credit default swap, which is a contract to sell protection against default. It has a uh, 96 probability of X profit, right? And 4% probability of $100 million loss. So X profit is essentially the price of this insurance you're selling, right? So maybe, uh, you know, it's easier to understand what it is. So you're saying, what is the price that you want to charge someone to sell them insurance against $100 million loss? And this insurance only is paid out if some, ref, some other company reference name defaults, right? So what is the price at which you're selling this insurance, right? If you go on the, or rather, if you're a market participant, what is the market clearing price at which this insurance will be sold on the financial market? Because you could decide to sell it for you know, zero uh, or some enormous price, right? If you sell it at zero, everybody will keep buying it from you until you're bankrupt. If you sell it at some enormous price, nobody will buy it from you, so you will not execute this uh, deal. So what is the price at which financial markets will trade this insurance, right? Is it more than uh, 4.167? 
Is it exactly 4.167 million? And just you know, to spare you the math, it makes the probability weighted average zero, right? So if you charge 4.167 million, the probability weighted average profit will be zero. Is it 4 million, which makes the probability weighted loss zero, right? So because uh, the first one averages 4% of 100 million and 96% of X, right? The second one averages just the loss, right? Or less than 4 million. So let's launch the poll. Off to the races. Four answers. The last one, maybe you may have to scroll back for the last. Okay, so there are three. Okay, one of them really clearly winning. Okay, now it races more even. Oh, wow. One of the answers overtook the initial lead. All right, well, what's interesting is that there was only one answer. There's only one word for the correct answer. Uh, the person who voted correctly, uh, please contact us because I think we have a drop uh, opening actually uh, for someone who was able to figure out what the correct answer is. So far, it's just one participant. So if you, after the end of the poll, see that your answer was correct, please contact Anastasia. We'll schedule a drop interview. And, and this is not a drop, by the way. Of course, everybody else is also welcome, but this will be like a huge uh, positive. All right, so, so far only one correct answer. That's interesting. Still one correct answer. All right, so, well, we are a little short on time. So let's uh, finish the poll. Still one correct answer. It's amazing, right? Okay, so, um, right, share results. Okay, so here are the results. Okay, so more than 4.167 million, one answer, right? You are the winner. The other three, which are about equal, are all incorrect, right? So, so what's the deal, right? So the correct answer, is um, uh, the correct answer is more than 4.167 million. So what's going on here, right? Is it not the average? Well, that's the consequence of something called the market price of risk. And uh, well, you know, to be fair, I think that someone who gave this correct answer uh, probably already knows something about man finance because uh, this is something that's completely, basically if you knew nothing about, if I knew nothing about man finance, I would not select answer one. I would select uh, as many people did, uh, answer two, right? Which is the average. However, the correct answer is one, right? More than 4.167 million. So, so what is the reason it's not the average, right? Because, you know, we would expect it would be the expected value. You know, we would think it would be the expected value, but it's not. Okay, what, what happens is that there are risk-seeking and risk-averse investors, right? So a risk-seeking investor can be found in a casino sitting at the roulette table, right? So if we disregard casino's edge, the risk-seeking investor is willingly exchanging $1 for an equal chance of zero or two dollars, right? If you go and uh, to play roulette, right, and you put on black or red, you're essentially taking your dollar and you're exchanging it for equal probability. If we disregard, uh, you know, uh, uh, casino edge, right, uh, of zero and two dollars. Most people in mark who trade in financial markets are the opposite of casino gamblers right and strongly prefer certainty to uncertainty so risk seeking investor is in a casino in the financial markets more people are risk averse and because the market clearing price is the price paid by the median median investor right not the average investor the median investor so you know i assume everybody knows what uh, median is right so uh, median is uh, in a distribution, let's say of 100, it's that person, right? Such that equal number of people would offer the lower price and equal number of people would offer the higher price, right? So the majority of investors, in the sense that not just the majority, meaning like the average, right? The median investor is king. In financial markets, the median investor is the investor who determines the price. So the median investor say, I'm median investor. You know, I decide what the price will be. Well, if your price is not in line with all of the other investors, you will no longer be the median and the crown will go to someone else. So the investor in the middle, where's the crown of the middle median investor and the price offered by this investor is the market clearing price. Because if the price was lower, there will be more uh, buyers than sellers. 
in the market makers would increase the price. If the price is higher, there would be more sellers than buyers and the market makers would lower the price. The price at which the instrument is selling is the price that the median investor thinks is right. Does the investor such that half the people think the price should be lower than that, half the people think the price should be higher than that and, and this investor is in the middle. In the median investor is the risk averse investor. There are gamblers in the market. There are like crazy people everywhere, right? But the gamblers in the market are in the minority, right? People who are so risk averse, they're not willing to take any risk are also in the minority. So the median investor is on average somewhat risk averse, right? But not, you know, totally risk averse. So because the average investor is risk averse, the market price of risk is the additional income that the median investor who determines the market clearing price demands as a reward for taking risk. And so these investors prefer definite dollar today to the expected value of some probability distribution where you can have a loss or you can have a gain. So they have to be paid for taking risk. So when the stock grows faster than the risk rate, this is the effect of the market price of risk, right? So the, the reward demanded by the investors above the interest paid the, the risk-free bank deposit for taking the risk of investing, right? In our CDS example, the seller of protection against default has enormous risk of selling, uh, of losing 100 million. Market clearing price. So maybe, you know, some people again are, are gamblers and they would uh, basically just uh, collect this profit, maybe not a lot of profit because they hope that the $100 million loss will not happen. But most, the median investor in the market is risk averse and they will require being paid more than the expected value of their investment in order to take this enormous risk. And actually a lot more. It turns out that in CDS markets, the bigger the risk, the bigger the market price of risk. And 100 million loss is a pretty extreme risk. So the market clearing price of CDS if it has like 4% of probability of default, it's not around 4 million. It's like gonna be like around 20 or 40, right? So this is a five to 10 factor increase in what people are willing to sell this insurance for when this insurance protects against enormous loss, right? So it's not just a tiny difference, it's a huge difference. Uh, it's smaller for when the risk is just of stock going up and down. It's much higher when the risk is like of losing the entire investment like we CDS. So CDS sellers demand compensation for this additional risk by pricing the deal using what's called market implied probability of default. Market implied probability of default is the probability that when you plug this probability into the formula, then you get the correct price. So they assume, well, you know, the real probability of default is 4%, but they will price CDS as though it was like 20 or 40, right? That's because they are risk averse. So, uh, Finally, the final topic for today is the investment performance measurement, right? And here we need to learn how to separate the brave from the foolish, right? So we need to understand how much risk is worth taking to achieve a gain. And when we achieve a certain gain, we need to understand if it was luck or it was skill, right? So first of all, uh, what is the investment manager section? Uh, what is investment performance, uh, you know, slide doing in a lecture about risk. Well, by no arbitrage principle, investment managers who do not take any risk or the possibility of a loss will not make any profit either, right? Which means that performance of an investment managers can only be measured relative to the risk they take. Given the same performance, I will choose the manager that achieved this performance by taking less risk. Or given the same level of risk, I will choose the manager that achieved better performance. Uh, those of you who talk to, uh, you know, active fund managers, right, in, you know, they exist in any country, in some countries they're better regulated, in some countries they're less regulated, and, uh, you know, they uh, have um, basically no, they, they, you know, in this case, they uh, really give you, you know, maybe outrageous claims. So most of these investment managers, and again, so this happens, uh, you know, in the major bank uh, in the United States, or you know, a company that consists of uh, three college graduates who just decided to invest money for, for you know, as a job, right? So they always show you past results. And in the countries where regulators are strong, usually there is like a little thing in the bottom that says past performance is no guarantee of future results, right? So the regulators make you put this uh, in European Union or United States and Great Britain, right? So the uh, regulators will make you put the statement in the bottom 
past performance is not guaranteed on future results. It's usually in such a small print that nobody reads it. But when the investment manager shows you, oh, look, you know, last year our strategy either made or would have made. Would have made is actually the worst, right? So they didn't even invest, right? They're just saying the strategy, if they invested, it would have made, you know, they have 100 strategies. They choose the one that would have made a lot of money. It doesn't mean that it will make this money in the future. But even if they did invest, and I'm not even talking about crooks who tell you that they did invest and make this profit. In fact, they did not because you cannot check. Even if they did invest, if they don't tell you how much risk they took, don't, you know, don't believe them, right? Because anybody can get lucky, right? In fact, people who did not get lucky, right? If they're honest and they're not lying about their performance, they will, they will not come to you, you know, saying, well, you know, Hey, uh, you know, our firm lost, uh, you know, 10% of the investment. Please invest with us because next year we won't, right? You normally don't hear that. Uh, right? You rarely hear that, right? Some people uh, have the guts, you know, to do that as well, you know, but uh, but uh, normally not, right? They say, well, you know, the, the investments, our, our firm made 10 million last year and they made 10 million the year before and they made 20 million the year before, right? So invest with us, right? The question is, well, how much risk did you take? If they don't answer this question and you don't answer this question for yourself, that's only half of the picture. And as, as we see in a moment, it's totally meaningless, right? So you cannot understand the skill of the investment manager or your prospects for making an investment with them unless you understand not only the profit they're making, but also the risk that they're taking to make this profit. So we will discuss uh, in the rest of this lecture how to make risk-sensitive investment performance measures, how to use risk-sensitive investment performance measures to compare the skill of managers who achieve different returns by taking different levels of risk. In this discussion, we'll apply equally to the performance of an investment, such as a stock, in the performance of an investment manager who performs active trading, right? So, so you can measure the risk of just investing and holding a stock or giving your money to someone who will invest it for you by buying and selling stocks. And again, so, you know, with the caveat that uh, in the countries with poor regulation, uh, they may also just uh, go to the Bahamas and, uh, uh, you know, steal the investment, right? But I'm talking about just people who are honestly trying to make money. The question is, uh, what is the risk they're taking by trading, right? Okay, so first question is like, what is the benchmark against which uh, we will measure investment performance? It's often assumed that investment performance is measured relative to not investing. but as we discussed in lecture two, for sufficiently large amounts of money, uh, keeping the money under the mattress is not actually a practical option. So comparing to this option is meaningless, right? Investment performance is usually measured relative to keeping money in the bank. So earning the rate of interest for short-term deposits called the short rate, right? So you compare relative to you put money in the bank and last year the bank paid very little. This year there is inflation, interest rates are going up. The bank pays a little bit more and will pay even more in the future. So normally that's the typical way that the investment, like, uh, you know, the investment measure that we'll talk about uh, uh, at the, in the next few slides, the sharp ratio, that's typically is measuring um, in, uh, performance of the investment against the uh, riskless interest rate. But sometimes you measure performance with respect to the benchmark, right? For example, there are active investment managers who say, our goal is to outperform the S&P 500 index, right? So S&P 500 index is the uh, index which tracks the performance, uh, it's the average of the financial performance of uh, 500 stocks selected by a committee in the US stock market. But the stock is actually, is kind of a global index because most of these companies in the S&P 500 index, they're global companies with class customers all over the world. So this is really not just the US index, right? It's a global index. Active investment managers, because a lot of people do that, they come and uh, say, you know what? Invest with us and we will beat the S&P 500. We'll bring you a return that's better than S&P 500. Now, when they do that, right? You don't want to compare the performance to the short, short trade. If they make an explicit objective, if they state that the explicit objective of the fund is to beat the S&P 500, you want to compare the investment performance to the S&P 500, right? In other words, if they, if they made 21%, but the S&P 500 made 25%, they actually lost money, right? 
So they, if they, on the other hand, if the S&P 500 index lost 20%, right? And they only lost 15%, that's a huge you know, advantage. In this case, you want to measure their performance relative to what they identify as their benchmark. You will measure the performance against this benchmark and they will, uh, you will measure their performance against the benchmark and they will uh, target their investment strategy against the same benchmark, right? Okay, so uh, for investment managers, right, whose objective is to, um, uh, you know, outperform, uh, you know, a specific index, right? Uh, you measure against the index for investment managers, which uh, let's say invest, uh, you know, in startup companies, right? You measure against there is an index published by uh, Bloomberg, for example, that basically tells you the average performance of funds like that. So first thing about measuring investment manager skill is that you have to use the right yardstick. You have to measure it against what they are promising to outperform, right? Second thing is that uh, leverage, right? So leverage is the ability of market participants, uh, sorry, there's a type of here, participants, right? To borrow money to finance the trading activities. To simplify things, let's assume that the investment manager is able to borrow money from the prime broker or the bank's treasury at the short rate, right? So in reality, the manager will also need to pay a small additional spread over the short rate. So armed with leverage, the investment manager becomes a superhero who can deliver a multiple of the previous investment return over the short rate. So for example, if we are comparing the investment manager return over the short rate, right, over the keeping money in the bank, if the manager wants to increase the return tenfold, right? So in other words, you choose the same stocks, you choose the same investments, but you want to have not 1% return, but 20% return or 10% return, right? Let's assume that you had a strategy which brings you 1% return or profit in a year, but you want 10, right? All you have to do is to make a loan in the amount of nine times the value of your investment and invest 10 times more money in the position, right? So if your original strategy bought one share of stock, the leverage strategy will buy 10 shares, right? And if the value of the investment is negative, then you will, for example, if you're selling something, right? If you're selling insurance, right? So you, you, so you uh, basically get paid instead of paying for it. In this case, you take it, this, you do it 10 times more and you put the money uh, with the prime broker uh, or, or, or a bank. So in other words, if you can borrow at the short rate and your investment is measured against the short rate, you can control how much you make, right? So, you know, you basically, you go to a client and say, well, you know, I made 1% uh, and they say, well, that's terrible, right? You know, we want more. Okay, fine. So, you know, you're going to borrow 10 times more and next year, everything exactly the same, same strategy, you say, now I made 10%. Still not enough? Okay, I made 20%, right? So I just borrowed 20 times more. Okay, well, something has got to be, you know, there's got to be cash here, and there is, right? So the amazing ability of leverage to increase positive investment returns is matched only by the equally amazing ability to increase negative investment returns, or losses, in other words, within risk, right? So consider a trader who gets stopped when the portfolio is 10% down. Right, either by, the, by his manager or the, by the prime broker making a margin call. Right, so margin call means involuntary involuntary refund or borrowed funds when the investment purchased using these funds and used as a collateral loses some of its value. The margin call crystallizes the loss on the investment. By the way, we're at the end of the ninety minutes, but um, uh, let's you know probably take five more. So so I apologize for that. Right. So margin call. Uh, what happens is that when you borrow money from someone, you pledge that instead of this money, if you cannot return the money, you will return them to your investment. But if the investment loses value, then they will make a margin call. They force you to sell the investment and they take whatever is left. Right. And typically either the trader will get stopped when there is a loss by their manager or the bank owner, investment fund uh, director, or the prime broker, the party that lent them the money will stop them because they don't want to lose even more, right? So if the trader who invests one in one share of stock gets, gets stopped at 10% loss of the stock price, if you borrow 10 times more in bought 10 shares, right? you still get stopped relative to not what you borrowed, but your original dollar, right? So if you took a dollar and bought one share, or you took 
a dollar borrowed nine more and bought 10 shares, then you get stopped not when the stock price goes down 10%, you get stopped when the stock price goes down 1%. And the stock can very easily go 1%. So your loss probability increases, right? And your stop probability, it also increases, right? So, so you have a bigger loss and you have a high pro higher probability of stop. So uh, with a typical daily volatility, 10% loss is rare, especially if you invest in many stocks, but 1% loss happens all the time. Now that's a tenfold leverage. If anybody again traded Forex, right? You know that they're offering 500 leverage. And what happens is if you use enormous leverage like that, it's only a matter of time until you as a retail investor lose all of the money because you get a margin call, you know, any hiccup, right? Any minor move in the FX rate, they do the margin call, same thing with crypto, right? So by leverage, by borrowing, you increase the probability of a loss and the probability of a margin call, right? So leverage helps you, it's a magical thing that helps you increase and basically make your return whatever you want it to be, right? As long as you don't actually get stopped and lose everything. So proper use of leverage is a highly effective tool in the hands of a skillful skilled investment manager because an uh, investment manager can use a model to construct a diversified portfolio, which increases the positive drift of portfolio value while suppressing its fall, right? So if you have a skillful manager, you can construct a portfolio which will bring you some profit with a minimal amount of risk. And these portfolios often, when you construct them, have much smaller expected drift and volatility compared to a typical stock. For example, you observe that two stocks move together and one of the stocks moves a little bit faster than the other. So you buy the first stock, you sell the second stock, and then you have higher probability of profit with lower probability of loss. But the move, daily move is now not the move of stock, but the move of difference, which is much smaller. So when you construct a diversified portfolio with the risk properties that you want, you can then list, use leverage to increase the volatility of that portfolio back to what you want it to be. And typical volatility that investment managers, or at least you know, investment hedge funds, target is 10%, right? So typically, most traders would be happy with about 10% volatility per year. Nobody would uh, you know, kill them as like 10% volatility, right? But they hope that the positive uh, drift in the stock uh, will, uh, you know, if you have enough good enough, uh, basically, skill, then with 10% volatility and positive return, your probability of getting stop at the end of the year is uh, not high. So it's good. If, if you think it's uh, still too high, you know, then you can uh, uh, reduce it even uh, further. So leverage helps you set the volatility or risk at the right level after you constructed your portfolio. But misuse of leverage is uh, highly dangerous. And it's something that when investment managers say, well, we had the 10% return, we had 15% return, unless they tell you how much leverage they used and how much risk they took. This is not the full picture. And leverage, even if they use leverage, some people misuse leverage, they have bad returns and they're trying to take more risk to make it look better. And some people use leverage properly because they construct a conservative portfolio and then increase the volatility to the level they want. So just knowing the leverage is only also not, it's part of the getting to the correct answer about the, the manager skill, but it's only one of the inputs, right? It's not the answer. So how to measure it, right? So we need the risk sensitive performance measure such that two managers who achieve the same investment return, one of them who achieved it by skillfully managing a portfolio and the other one who used leverage to convert, to convert a bad return into a good one and just got lucky, right? Uh, eventually the second manager will lose everything for the investors. So we are looking for an investment measure that is risk sensitive. So not only it tells us about how good the return is, but also how much risk was taken to achieve the return, right? And this one of these measures is sharp ratio. It's the most popular investment performance measure. There's also something called Sertina ratio, which uh, we don't have time to discuss, but you can look it up. So sharp ratio is, discussed, is the ratio of annualized investment return measured relative, measured relative to the short rate and annualized standard deviation of that return. Annualized means either measured for or scaled to one year horizon, right? So if it's a daily, you multiply by what? Square root of the number of business days per year, right? Because uh, it's a random process. 
consider a manager who misuses uh, uh, or rather you you sorry you, you multiply standard deviation by square root of course the return you multiply just by the time right? so consider a manager who misuses the tenfold average if this manager gets lucky right avoids a stop and original strategy produces a positive return the leverage strategy will produce 10 times higher return and also 10 times higher standard deviation right so you measure standard deviation of a daily move so even if this manager who turned bad return, who is not skillful, bad skills, bad return, used leverage to make it look good, the return will increase tenfold, but also the volatility. So the sharp ratio will be the same for the original strategy for the leverage strategy and bad. So far sharp ratio will not be fooled by the misuse of leverage to increase the return. It will recognize the only investment manager skill which is a mediocre skill in this case. We still need expected shortfall to guard against extreme low probability losses, such as the losses that occur from selling CDS. But sharp ratio is the only, uh, or not only, but, but you know, is the right uh, measure for measuring or determining investment manager skill because it's sensitive to not only the return, but also the risk taken to obtain this return. So summary, risk measurement involves using quantitative measures of risk, such as value at risk and the newer measure expected shortfall to determine the amount of risk in a portfolio or investment strategy. Risk management as opposed to measurement involves designing an investment strategy to have the desired amount of risk. And sometimes this involves reducing risk using hedging and sometimes increasing use risk using leverage. Market price of risk is the price market participants are willing to pay for the absence of risk. Absence of risk is a highly valuable asset available for sale in the financial markets. It essentially is a financial markets equivalent of an insurance. It's an insurance traded in the financial markets as security or as over the country instrument. And investment performance measurement means evaluating investment managers, not only by the absolute returns, but also by how much risk they are taking to achieve these returns. And specifically, sharp ratio helps distinguish between the investment managers that achieve the returns by superior skills and those that achieve the returns by endangering their employer and the clients. So that concludes uh, uh, our third lecture. Uh, and uh, on Thursday, at the same time, we'll have the final lecture we will cover other asset classes. Uh, and uh, at the end of that lecture, uh, uh, we'll provide information on um, the certificate for completing the course uh, and uh, on a quiz that will be um, uh, you know, given uh, to those who are interested in the certificate. Uh, Nastya, anything else to add uh, today before we wrap up? Not really. Okay, great. All right, so uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, and uh, uh, look forward to the final lecture on Thursday. And the person who answered correctly during the very last poll, please contact us. That's right, yeah. All right, thank you.